Hello, and welcome to build and operate your first OpenStack application. Um, my name is James Dempsey. I work with a company called Catalyst in New Zealand doing private and public clouds. Um, with me, we have Christian Berendt from B1 Systems. And from Mirantis, we have Sean Collins and Nick Chase. And we also have Tom, but Tom is not here. <laughs> Tom is not here. I'm sure that Tom, oh, Tom Fifield, yes, from the foundation. He did a lot of this work. I remember Tom. So why are we here? Um, the short answer is Christian wrote an application, and then we wrote a guide about installing this application in OpenStack clouds. Why are you here? So there are a few reasons that you could be here. You're a developer, and you want to develop OpenStack applications. That's a good reason to be here. You're an operator or an advocate, kind of like myself, and you see a need for this documentation. Or you're lost. So there were two very, very good looking Ceph talks happening right now, and also one Neutron talk. So you may be lost. I won't take offense if you need to get up and find the correct talk. That's OK. Or some other reason. If, if you're here for a reason that is not on this list, come and talk to me. I'm curious about everybody's motivations. Um, just tap me on the shoulder at some point. Why am I here? So I build clouds. Um, I like to see my developers win. I like to see them build awesome things. And so I view this as a way for me to sort of foster the growth of my cloud. Um, I like my developers. Um, I don't like my developers standing at my desk. Um, there, there's a slight problem. They're all lovely people, but I do not scale. And so when people come to me and say, hey, James, how do we do this thing in the cloud? And I take five minutes and explain to them, and everybody's happy and everybody smiles. Um, and then 10 minutes later, somebody else comes and asks the same question. Um, I can't handle that. So hopefully, this application and this guide will help everyone to learn, and I don't have to scale. So I'm also selfish and kind of greedy. Um, when I have developers who are enabled and informed and build awesome things in the cloud, people use those awesome things. And when people use those things, they need to scale out. Um, and when that happens, directors come to me and say, James, we are going to buy you bigger, shinier toys. So, I view this as also a way to get a bigger, better cloud, more switches, more routers, all of this. Um, and so my goal is essentially to plant seeds in your brain. Um, this is an introduction on building applications in OpenStack. Um, some of it will go into detail. Some of it will be broad ideas and concepts. But really, I just want you to sort of think about what the possibilities are. And then if you walk away with ideas, that's excellent. And I've done my job. So next, I'll hand off to Christian, who will talk to you about the application. So yes, so before we um, could start it to um, write the documentation itself, we needed something to document. Um, so um, we needed to build um, an application. And um, we decided to write our own application, because we do not want to decide, so for example, to use um, um, WordPress or, or some other kind of application. So we ended um, with um, this application. So this is the web interface of the application. And it's simply an, an fractal image generator. So you can uh, generate a lot of fractal images with this application, really large fractals, and a lot of them on, on compute nodes. And um, this way, we have a scalable application. You do not have to care about how it works. It's a black box application. You just have an installer uh, we use inside um, the document so that you can call the um, installer on your compute nodes and so on. And then you have um, a simple CLI interface to generate uh, the fractals. And you have the web interface to see the fractal images. And then you can share them uh, with your friends and so on. And you can reuse them for, for some need. So that's all. And, and then around this application, we um, wrote the documentation itself. So and in this documentation, we demonstrate how to use this application on the cloud platform, like uh, with OpenStack. And yeah. Cool. So the user guide, this is what the top 
eighth of the front page of it looks like. A lot of it is very similar to this. Um, the reason this exists is we saw a documentation gap. And that was revolving around getting new users of the cloud bootstrapped so that they can become effective. So this guide aims to do two things, it aims to do at least two things. Um, lower the barrier of entry um, for new developers. We want to have a step-by-step -step guide where you can copy and paste things or download the script and make changes um, so that you can get going without having to figure out uh, what code do I need to write next? What am I, what am I missing? What do I not know that I'm missing? Um, the other reason is we want to get you thinking about how applications should be architected differently when deployed to the cloud. Um, it's, it's easy to take infrastructure and then copy it into the cloud, um, and then it's just the same. And, and you have problems because there's sort of a different modality that needs to, to sort of be imbued in your applications. Um, so you have to, for instance, plan for failure. Um, plan for failure, hypervisors crash, plan for outages. I don't know if you've heard about the Venom vulnerability. So everybody had their instances surprise rebooted. Um, so you need to be prepared for that. You need to be prepared for performance issues. You'll have noisy neighbors in the cloud that you wouldn't necessarily have had in your sort of bespoke infrastructure. Um, in addition to that, there are a number of service offerings. In, these can be exceedingly helpful to use, and it's not always intuitive how they should be used. So things like object storage. What, what does that mean for application development in the cloud? Um, so hopefully, we will explain some of these things and give advice. So here, I will pass it over to Nick, and he will chat about some of the sections, and then we'll start going through the sections one by one, right. hitting the high points. OK, so uh, what I wanted to do here is kind of talk a little bit about the structure of the document, just to kind of lay, give, give you the lay of the land to talk about uh, the types of things that you need to think about. So uh, as James was saying, it's a whole different mindset when you're talking about a cloud application. Um, you have to think about um, different aspects of what you're putting together. And um, now Christian was talking about the application. What we're really talking about here is two applications. Okay, we have the application that users are going to interact with, and then we have the application that deploys and manages it among the OpenStack instances that you're going to deploy. And so the part that your users interact with, that's the black box. That's the part you don't need to know what it does. You don't need to know how it works. All you need to know is it gave us a good example for something that you would have a reason to scale up uh, or scale out. It's the part, it's the management part that we're going to show you how to build in this uh, in this session. So basically, we're going to start out by just showing you the very basics. How do you create a VM? How do you destroy a VM? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, then we're going to talk about, OK, now that I've got the basics, so you know I, I can do that, well, what's the point of putting it in the cloud? Well, I need to be able to scale it out and give it more resources when we're getting, you know, when somebody's asking for 1,000 fractals instead of two. Um, all right, now we've, we've got all that taken care of, but now what good is making all these fractals if nobody can actually see them? So um, now we're going to make it durable. So we're going to store files. It's not just about storing these fractals. Storing files are things that you guys do all the time in your applications. And that's the whole point of this. We tried to build something that you could generalize to your own situation. So. Um, so we talk about um, block storage, the same thing. You know, we've got moving to uh, database as a service and so on. Orchestration, of course, that's almost the whole point of this whole thing. Because if all you were going to do was, oh, look, we've got, um, you know, we've got capacity up at 90%. Uh, let me go quickly start up another VM. You don't really need cloud for that. Okay, what you need is a situation where, oh, look, 
it got up to 90% or 60% or 80% or whatever you set it to, and it automatically scaled it up. I don't have to touch it. So we'll talk about how to do that. Uh, and of course, wouldn't be an OpenStack talk if we weren't talking about networking. So uh, thank God we have Sean here, because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we've got some general advice. It's just like, OK, look, if you're going to do this, think about these things, because this will help you. So, um, so that's the general lay of the land, what we're going to do. So uh, uh, getting started here, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to decide what SDK we're going to use. Now, this, in, this particular, uh, in this particular example that you're going to see, we used libcloud. Libcloud is just a cloud API you know, SDK, basically. It doesn't matter which one you use. The concepts are all the same. Okay? We just had to pick one <laughs> for this example. And this one was the most complete when we were writing this book. So, um, so we'll, we'll go through. And so you'll choose an SDK. Um, in this case, we're going to look at connecting to the APIs. Remember about OpenStack, everything is built as an API. You know, that's the whole point of cloud. It's all an API. I don't have to go in there and modify the Nova database. You know, no, I just call the API. Um, and in this case, we are talking about the general OpenStack API, not the individual project uh, REST APIs. And then uh, we're going to actually deploy the application to the uh, to an instance that we create. So we're going to start there. But yeah, thank you. That's probably better. All right. So this is um, this is the example. So we uh, so we start out looking at. Is this a laser pointer also? Oh, we'll just we'll work with it. So as you can see here, um, you can look. If you see auth, you know auth username, auth password. Those all look familiar, I'm sure, because those are the typical authentication parameters that you have on any OpenStack application that you are doing. So we're going to grab all of that, grab your region name, and you're going to need to create a connection. Obviously, without a connection, you can't do anything. So we start out by uh, we get a provider. All right, in this case, it's an OpenStack provider. Remember, I said this is libcloud. It doesn't have to be OpenStack. In this case, it is. So we get the provider. Um, so from the OpenStack driver, then we create the connection. Now, you know when you are creating, when you are launching a VM, well, what are you launching it from? Well, you're getting an image. You're deciding what flavor you want. We're doing the same thing here. Okay? So we're saying, all right, I'm going to do this particular image, and this is the flavor that I need based on the size. Um, you know, and when you are creating a VM, you want to give it you know, a key pair. We'll set aside the argument. No, I don't really need a key pair. Yes, you need a key pair. OK? Let's not argue about it. You need a key pair. All right? Um, you're going to create a security group. All of these are the same things you normally do. So um, then we're going to go ahead. Now, when we create this instance, we can tell it to go ahead and do something. So in this case, as you can see here, I don't want to, like, yeah, there it is, OK. So as you can see here, when we create the instance, we are going ahead and we're passing it all the information that you would normally pass in when you uh, create an instance, say, you know, you know, booting you know, using Nova. But one thing that we're doing here is this user data. Now, in this case, what that is, is that is a command, or in this case, a series of commands. Uh, I'm sorry, well, actually, it's really just, yeah, it is a series of commands. That's <laughs> what I get for looking at it closely. Um, that the instance is going to, the VM is going to execute when it starts up. So we're creating this VM, and this is just the install for our um, for a fractal application. It doesn't matter what this command is. 
In this case, we're just using that command because it's convenient. We're talking about how to install this particular application. Could be anything. Okay? So once we set up um, what that instance is, then we are just going to go ahead and wait until we get word that it's running. Okay? Fairly straightforward. Anybody have any glaring, oh my god, it's not making any sense questions? Good. OK, so now we've got it. We need to go ahead and um, we need to go ahead and make it accessible. So we're going to go ahead and grab a floating IP. You notice these are all the things that you normally do when you're creating an application, uh, in, in, when, you're, when you're working with OpenStack. But the thing about all these is, you know, we're grabbing an IP, we're you know, connecting to it, we're attaching it to uh, uh, the VM, rather. In this case, we're printing out a statement that says, OK, where it is, so that people can get to it. The important thing about all this is this is all programmatic. Okay? You're doing this in a program. There is no reason that you can't add logic to this program to manage your overall cloud environment. That's the key that it takes a lot of people a minute, once they get to that point, because they know it's like, I want to run an application on the cloud. OK, well, run as you know, James was saying. Taking your legacy workload and dumping it into the cloud does not make it a cloud application. It makes it an application in the cloud, but it is not a cloud application. A cloud application is one that reacts to the environment. And this, this stuff here, all of this code that I've been showing you, that's how you react to the environment. So if something goes down, you could restart it, whatever it is. And this is going to be, this is just a quick example of um, what we were just looking at. So as you can see here, um, we're going to go ahead, getting started.py is just the, you can see it's just the actual code that we were just looking at. And we'll go ahead and um, run it. And you can see what it's doing. It's generating all this information. It's listing out uh, the available images, the available flavors, all of that stuff. So, and you can see here, we've created a key pair, and so on. So you can see the output, checking the IP, the floating IP, and so on. And there you go. And so we've got it deployed. So um, I'm going to go ahead and. Oh, we've got a couple more seconds on here. OK, so there you go. So you can see, ah, OK, yeah, we're going to see that it actually worked. <laughs> we did slide a few minutes out because it does some app to get installs in this process. So there is five minutes of missing time yes. that I am not subjecting you to. Right. You're welcome. <laughs> and then you can see there's the image. So there you go. All right, so I think uh, do we need to advance here. Yep. Okay, there we go. Um, oh, I was going to talk about this piece. Okay, so um, this is kind of the basic. You know what? I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to let so you do this one. Yeah, you over. take this okay. one. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> I was going to do it. No. So this is just um, a quick view on the architecture of the um, fractals app itself. So you have not to take care about this architecture, but. Um, it's simply uh, that we have normally an API to access our cloud application so that we do not have to care about the entry point. On the, on the back side, we have um, a database um, to store everything um, and so that we have a stateless application that we can simply um, move the API node and so on. And um, we have the web interface in front of the API so that we can see something. And we have, of course, um, the workers on the to compute all the fractal images. And the, the workers are necessary to be scalable so that we can have a lot of workers. So we cannot only have one um, instance of the worker. We can have um, <coughs> 10 or 1,000 of them to, to generate the fractals. And all of, so, so we can run all of the services um, multiple times on multiple nodes. So that we can be fault tolerant, it um, doesn't matter if um, an API service dies because we most have several um, um, nodes. 
And, and this way we have um, a scalable, fault-tolerant, stateless um, cloud application that can be automated, for example, with heat for the deployment with the installer. And in front of all of this, we have an API to control it via the CLI or via the web interface. And this is just um, the normal um, architecture of a scalable cloud application. Yeah, that's it. So now we get to scaling out. Um, this is one of the sections in the user guide, and we take the original application that was deployed in this sort of all-in-one fashion and figure out how we can make it more scalable. So we move the database and message queue services to its own instance, and then we sort of look for the other components which are stateless and easily replicated without having to do magic between them. And we find that we can have multiple API instances because they're just taking requests and then putting that onto the work queue. And then we can have multiple worker instances. I have API in there twice. Imagine one of those is worker. Um, <laughs> multiple worker instances. And so we scale out. They can do fractal generation in parallel. Um, it's much more performant and is fault tolerant. You kill a worker, and maybe you will lose one fractal that was sort of in progress, but you don't lose the ability to create new fractals. And that's sort of the important thing. Um, an interesting thing to point out here is when you look at the database and the message queue and you say, I will put them on an instance, that's sort of saying something important. And, and we have sort of implicitly identified them as components that we don't know how to scale. So when you have taken the stateless things and made them really big, you need to go back and say, OK, now what mess do I have remaining? Well, I've got a database and an MQ, and that's dangerous. I need to figure out uh, at some point, how do I make this particular choke point more robust? Um, and that's not in the guide. You can figure that as an exercise. So after scaling out, we talk about durability. Um, durability in this context, we're going to talk about object storage. And object storage is essentially a place for you to cram objects. It's a REST API. You have containers, and you put objects into containers. And then you have this namespace that can be accessed over HTTP. Um, one of the selling points for object storage is the durability. Oftentimes, cloud providers will replicate objects multiple times and only tell you that, yes, I have received your object once it is safely on however many nodes they care about. Um, and so you can get many of the nines that you want to make sure that you feel safe that your data is going to be in existence tomorrow. Um, ease of administration also. You don't have file systems that fill up. Um, you don't have that new sysadmin who learns in the middle of the night that there's a constant number of inodes on some file systems. Um, service resilience is another thing. If you have object storage that is replicating across multiple regions or multiple clouds, um, if one region goes down, you can point your uh, application at another region, and your application will continue going. Also, you get performance, because you're leveraging whatever fast storage these uh, object storage providers are using. Um, but there are caveats. You should understand that object storage is different depending on how you implement it. And you can't assume that uh, I have multiply replicated objects just because you've put them in object storage. You really do need to go and read your SLA, read what your performance is likely to be, um, and make sure that you sort of know the sharp points that you are likely to find. Um, in the context of the Fractals app, we use it to back up Fractals. And it's sort of a very simple use case, and there's a lot that could be expanded there. Um, but we use it for backups. And I, I won't show a demo of that. It's not really exciting. Um, but just think about it. Like I said, I just want to plant seeds in your brain. Um, block storage. So oftentimes, when you ask for an instance, you will get an ephemeral disk. And if that instance goes away, then your disk goes away. Um, and if that's a problem for you, then you need to look a 
at finding some persistent storage. And block storage is often where you would do that. Um, it gives you the fault tolerance against your hypervisors crashing and taking away your data. Uh, it gives you a limited amount of durability. Typically, it's pretty durable, but maybe not as durable as object storage. Again, read your SLAs. Um, oftentimes, you can get provisioned IOPS. If you have this database that really needs to go fast, you can say, please, can I have a fast disk, not just a regular disk? And you'll get that. One important thing to recognize is when you ask for a faster disk, you're scaling up and not out. And so that should raise red flags in your head. And you should say, OK, that has given me a little breathing room, because now I have a fast disk. But how long will it be until I can't ask for a disk that's fast enough for my workload? Um, these are the kinds of things that you need to consider when building cloud applications. Cloud applications, yes, not applications in the cloud. Um, as far as in the context of the Fractals app, we move the database from the ephemeral operating system disk on the services instance to an actual block device that has much better durability standards. Um, another thing to consider would be, uh, maybe I don't need to do block devices at all because Trove is implemented and I can use database as a service. Just a thing to think about. What do we have next? Ah, orchestration. Possibly the most interesting part of this, I think. Um, so what we viewed earlier was programmatic definition of infrastructure and application. We ran a program. It did things. It was automated. That was excellent. Um, another modality is declarative orchestration. So we can just say, OK, I don't actually care about these steps involved. Like I don't want to know, I don't want to have to know that after I create my instance, I need to tell my script to stand still and wait for the instance to finish building before I attach a floating IP, because I know that the port won't exist, and so I have to wait. Um, these are things that we don't really care about and we shouldn't really care about. Um, so declarative methods, so we use templates in this, uh, in this case, will let you just say, this is my infrastructure. You make it happen. This is your problem. Um, so in OpenStack, Heat does the orchestration. It uses templates. And you have environments. So you take these environments, and they're sort of data inputs into your templates. We'll have an example in a moment. Um, this gives you automatic dependency resolution. So again, I don't care what needs to happen first. I want, I want the orchestration service to take care of that. Um, orchestration will also take care of auto scaling. So it has integration with Solometer Alarm. So you can say, when CPU load gets high, scale this group out. Life is wonderful. Um, and it's also revision controlled infrastructure. Because if you define your networks in your orchestration templates, and those templates are in Git, you now have a full revision history of your physical, physical infrastructure. And not only that, but since it is tightly coupled with how you deploy applications, you have also that for applications. But sort of also even more interestingly, you have you know what your exact infrastructure looked like for this particular version. So if you have some weird interaction of, oh, my infrastructure caused a problem, and there's also a software bug, maybe you need to go back and, and sort of evaluate the entire ecosystem and knowing that this is what my infrastructure looked like at the exact time that I had this application bug can be very valuable. Um, here, we'll do an orchestration demo, I think. Yeah, we'll do an art demo. Um, so here we have nothing. And then we have two files. We have an environments file. This will be the input, the data that we push into our templates. So I'll have one environment file per cloud region. And then I'll just have a different environment file for the separate cloud region. Inside the template, we have inputs. Um, that's defining what is going to be in our environment. We can have default values. Um, and then we define resources. So here we have a router. We have networks. I think we defined three networks here. And then we define some instances. And the instances have ports and floating IP addresses. And we even have custom configuration options that we pass to them. 
and that is the rest of the file. So we have three instances here that we're creating. We have an app server, a database server, and a worker. So here we'll use the heat stat create command and give it our environments file and also our templates file. And we'll give it a lovely name. And then it's off. So now it will do all of the things that our programmatic script would have done, but it will do it in whatever order it thinks is important. So we've created networks. I, I should say, this example has some lies. I didn't create security groups. I didn't make sure that the SSH key was there. Um, so this part of the user guide is in progress. Um, you can also do some interesting things around template composition. So instead of defining three instances and sort of repeating yourself a lot of times, I think in Juno they have some features that make uh, composition of templates much better. So you can have concise templates that refer to other templates. And so you'll have network templates and application templates. And they'll just all be together, one big happy family. Um, and if you saw in the script earlier that there was a password in there, I'll just let you know that that is no longer the password. So don't, don't bother. Um, unless I'm just telling you that because I'm freaking out. Who knows? Um, Be there. <laughs> no, no, no. I actually did change it. I actually did change it. I just like awkward situations. Um, so here we go. We have our three instances. Um, we're not going to demo the application because that part doesn't work yet. So I'll pass it to Sean for networking. Okay. So my job was comparatively simple uh, compared to the great work that everybody else has done. Um, Obviously, from all of the tracks, uh, the networking track has been fairly popular. And my view was that in this uh, first app application guide, networking is the foundation on which everything uh, is realized. So all of the workers will communicate with each other using the networking pieces um, that are provided by the networking service, otherwise known as Neutron, with a uh, under, like no capital N for the Neutron for the uh, documentation standards. <laughs> so what I wanted to do was do a showcase of what the networking API could actually provide for you. Um, so what we started with was working with the command line interface, um, since the libcloud uh, API that we were using um, still has some work that needs to be done for the, neutro the Neutron provider. Um, so we just fell back to using the Neutron command line client uh, in most cases. So one of the concepts that we had through writing the first app application is the concept of segmentation, meaning that you would have the API services, you would have the database services, so you would have distinct pieces of functionality that were completely contained within either an instance or a template or something like that. On the networking portion, we wanted to have segmentation of the actual networking infrastructure where the database nodes would have their own private network that's isolated from the rest of the infrastructure. You would have API services that would have their own network segment, and then you would have the web piece that would probably have the actual external connectivity in, since that's what your users are going to be interacting with. The idea is, is that it's, in some cases, you're bringing over like a three-tier application into your cloud environment on the networking side. So um, the idea is, is that you would use your security group rules and then the addressing scheme that you're using between these instances to sort of separate things out um, so that they can be managed separately and one change in one area doesn't affect the rest of the, of the infrastructure. Um, so that's what the tenant networking does. We walk through creating the networks through the CLI. We do an actual creation of a router which will provide the external connectivity and then connectivity between all of the nodes in the network. Um, sort of a funny anecdote was originally I had it where it was three routers and I sort of went a little overboard with it and then I realized, oh, well, the three routers would have to have links between each other and then it sort of just grew into this big ball 
And then I just went back to just simplifying it a little bit by just having one router that would contain everything. Because we wrote this book in a week. Yes. <laughs> so. um, and then really what is probably the most pertinent info for an application developer is what the networking uh, service can do on the load balancing side of the equation, meaning that you can use the networking uh, load balancer functionality to load balance between your virtual machines and then swap pieces out if they have an error or it goes into a failure state without having to update DNS or have anything that the actual user is aware that something has happened behind the load balancer that has forced some configuration changes. Um, I did notice that uh, we worked, Nick and I and a few, a few others were doing the networking guide portion and that demonstrated like on the operator side of what neutron networking looks like when you're deploying. And I felt that the first app was very complimentary because it showed the other side of it where the consumers of the service, this is what you would have to do to use the load balancing API and, and so, so on and so forth. Because um, that needs to be documented uh, fully and understandably for our users so that they actually, as uh, James said, selfishly I want people to use the networking API and want more functionality out of it and have higher adoption because that keeps me uh, presenting every summit. <laughs> um, so with that, is there any other slides? Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to give a bit of advice very quickly. Um, I come from a systems administration background, so when I have a platform to talk to developers, I want to give good advice. Um, System and Appreciation Day, July 31st. A lot of developers don't realize how much is given to them by their systems team. And so I think if you are a developer who is new to doing operations, uh, it's worth sort of establishing communications and chatting with them and saying, hey, what is it that you are doing for me that keeps me safe, and how can I make sure that I'm doing the same thing in the cloud? Backups, always do backups. Security, you've got to apply those patches. Configuration, management, and deployment. This actually comes with orchestration. So if you're using the orchestration service, then this forces you to have good habits. Phoenix servers, uh, maybe consider designing your servers such that if they die, you don't even try and troubleshoot them. Just build a new one that sort of rises from the ashes. Fail fast. Um, use this as uh, an opportunity to try out new things, and if it doesn't work, just blow it away. If, it's, if your entire application is orchestrated, there's essentially no cost to trying something, so fail fast. And my favorite piece of advice, if you liked it, then you should have put some monitoring on it. Um, so resources, this uh, document is available in draft form up here on the, in the API site guide. Um, on GitHub, it's part of the OpenStack slash API site repo, and it's called First App. So if you generally Google for First App, you should find it. Thank you.